Kenya gained its independence in the year 1963 and it became a republic in the year 1964. We have been here ever since and each and every time our nation is introduced, the word republic is put in front of it. I am seated here today with a friend and a colleague of mine to talk about chapter two of the Constitution of Kenya, which focuses on the Republic of Kenya. Karibu sana. And you can introduce yourself by a few words. Hey, my name is uh, Salah Abdi Sheikh. I am. Uh, I, I introduce myself as a, as a writer, mm -hmm. an activist, mm -hmm. but otherwise I'm a businessman. And you're a Kenyan Somali. And I'm a Kenyan Somali from the north. Welcome to the Uma Action Podcast. Um, so, Chapter Two of the Constitution says Kenya is a sovereign republic. But kwa ule mama mboga mwenye akomtani na ataangalia i podcast, what does a sovereign republic mean? A sovereign republic means uh, we are not under any colony. We are a self-governing entity. We are uh, a country. Mm -hmm. We have uh, defined borders. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a state that uh, you know rules uh, the, 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 that region. Uh, 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 we are we are independent. It's very important, as you said, independent. Uh, although sometimes the independence uh, is not the way people think, you know, and there's, in the, there's independence and there's interdependence, then there is <laughs> de I, dependence on others for many things. So, but I think generally the republic will be self-governing. But are we really self-governing? The reality qua ground. Are, are we a really self-governing country? Uh, I think many people can contest that, mm -hmm. but uh, legally we are self-governing. We have instruments of power. <laughs> we have uh, uh, we have the the, the seal the. We, we have the flag. We have, um, you know, we have all the instruments that show that we are self-governing. We, we elect our own our own uh, uh, leadership. Uh, so there is no imposition by others on our country. So we are a republic. I will say there is no direct imposition on us because uh, um, the other thing you've mentioned is that we have boundaries and territories our marine waters were threatened just last year and migingo is a whole new issue and and hmm, i we did not come out strongly to really defend our territory i think uh, you know this country was created by the defined borders were created by the colonialists yeah and uh, if you look at the map of Kenya from 1918 to 1963, it has always been changing. Uh, it was a small, you know, patch at 1918. Mm -hmm. It moved to up to inclusive of Juba land in Somalia, yeah. uh, and then it came back to what it is in 1963. So, uh, whatever happened, whatever issues that were not resolved then, mm -hmm. are now coming out to resolve themselves. For instance, the maritime uh, dispute between Somalia and uh, and Kenya is an issue of representation of the borderline. Where does she, at the end of the borderline, how does it extend? Does it extend upwards or downwards? So the, 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 the conflict is just based on how that borderline goes. So it's not necessarily a threat to the sovereignty and defined borders of this country. Uh, the one of Mijingo uh, is the same thing. Uganda and, some, and, and, and Kenya probably did not resolve this issue through actual limitation of the borders uh, be, uh, up to now. And I think uh, because of that, because of that, the the Ugandans think that Mijingo is theirs, yeah. and Kenyans think Mijingo, um, Mijingo is occupied <laughs> by Kenyans. So, so I think it's an issue that should not be uh, should not be should not bring about hatred or you know uh, disagreement or war or anything of that. It's, it's something that the Africans can actually solve by themselves because who put them together anyway? It is it wasn't theirs. Yeah. It is a foreign power that came and created these countries. Yeah. So. When did we actually sit and said, uh, can we have now a uh, realignment of these things so that we know where each country ends and the other ones begin? So from my perspective, um, as somebody who comes from the north, the north was contested, if you know. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about the, the marine there, the north itself, the whole of the north, which is about a third of, of, of Kenyan territory, was contested by Somalia. And, then, and uh, up to today, they have not said that they actually released it. They, there was a... Uh, what we call the uh, uh, you know cessation of hostilities and agreement but uh, uh, we're not sure if there is a feature coming where they, they can say uh, we also wanted this one eh? and <laughs> kenya, kenya can also say we want jubala so you see the, oh, the, yeah. the, the, the issue has not been resolved but i don't see it as a very important matter that should dictate our attitude towards ugandans or towards uh, people of somalia or people of any other african territory 
yeah because i i think we um our tribes are so intertwined because um you'll get luos in in kenya and luos in uganda there's masai in kenya there's masai in tanzania so at some point i really don't think this borders even make sense um but then the conversation of doing away with that i don't think we are ready to have that yet as a continent what, what, what happened was in the 1960s there was the many african countries were getting independence so the first time the au organization of african you know uni, uh, unities which is called au mm-hmm. now it's au uh, saturday sort of uh, were worried about uh, you know uh, the rebellion and uh, you know uh, secession and all, all that kind of, of things happening so they said the borders should be the way the colonialists actually decided so because of that uh, it's very hard for african countries to actually come out and change their borders you know later late it became it became a political issue it became a sovereignty issue it became a teri- 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 it's called territorial, territorial integrity yeah. you know yeah. uh, something which was not there before the colonies so and you will see the same problem is with between tribes you see in africa Af- in africa tribes live within defined borders in our in our in our part of the of, of kenya uh, clans live within defined defined borders so you see now uh, it is the the mzungu that did that it's not us yeah, yeah so because of that we have tribalism you see the, the resultant of having that those divine borders is uh, because uh, now we have to fight for yes. these resources rather than yes. share them we should share them uh. and then you see in africa because of this uh, you know defined borders and because of the way you know we were we, you know we sort of we were nationalized through that you might be treated badly in an african country than in other countries in a foreign and, country and we treat foreigners better than better than, than we Afri- treat than our Africans. own oh yeah we See. talked about that a little yeah, in yeah. episode one, the preferential treatment that foreigners get over citizens but moving on now article 6 talks of devolution and access to services so we are aware that we have 47 counties um just talk about the counties of the north um I, i i wouldn't know if this is a challenge that you might have experienced getting national identification documents like a passport or just a national id i know during this um election year it's, it's going to be easy to get it because they need people to take the votes so that's going it's going to be very fast and quick i think one of my friends lost his id and he got it replaced within two day, two weeks two weeks record time <laughs> of two weeks but um we have a lot of young people from um the north especially the somali tribe and um other communities that live along the borders of kenya who um do not access services the same way i in nairobi will will get it i can walk into a huduma center at gpo and and get a, gam- a government service but what is the situation for someone who's in wajia Okay I think the national ID issue is related to what happened in the 1960s you know we are still having a hangover of what happened in the 1960s what, Ken- what is this hangover uh, based on the, the hangover is based on the fact that the north wanted to secede from Kenya we didn't oh. want to be part of it so uh, it was like you have to be part of Kenya and you know, I remember this this I was reading I'm writing a book on on the same issue at the moment so I'm reading like uh, how the people were reacting to the independence itself while everybody else was very happy the north were worried about being bundled into Kenya and one of the things that they raised is we don't want to be minority in a country of different you know other cultures and other religion and other uh, they were even worried about that mostly they were worried about lifestyle they were thinking like these polar farmers we are nomads and pastoralists so, that was a problem but then what happened was there was a war you know young people like you probably don't remember that don't i've never heard it because it's not taught in the syllabus <laughs> yes, it's not it is not <laughs> so in 1963 uh, from 1963 to 1960 67 68 there was a war called the war of secession of the north popularly known as shifta war so that shifta war Uh, north was saying that we don't want to be part of Kenya so Kenya, uh, north became part of Kenya because of force how how is this not in our syllabus and it happened in Kenya and it's a significant event uh, it, 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 i think the the idea was to keep it as a as as a sort of forgotten chinyamaji yeah, chinya <laughs> uh, and then you see the problem is if it was to be forgotten it should have been forgotten completely so you bring in the population give them the identity that they, they, that they need give them the services they need they need uh, and then they become part of just like any other 
any other citizen. But what happened was, it was sort of mkatenusu kind of agreement. You know, you you are given certain, you, you are a Kenyan, yes, but uh, you have to prove yourself. You have to prove that you are a Kenyan. Uh, if you also look at the history, then in 19, 1978, I think Moi was in a certain baraza, he said, we're going to, re- to you know, uh, uh, register all Somalis and uh, deport anybody who has allegiance to Somalia. He didn't say anybody who was from Somalia. He said anybody who was allegiance to Somalia. And the problem was, Somali here, Somali, Somali embassy here was giving uh, Kenyans uh, passports to go and to do go business. To in, no, to go and do business in the Middle East. Oh, in the Middle East, not here. <laughs> you understand? So, because of of that, you know, there was always Somalia trying to pull the population of of the north to Somalia, and Kenya not really doing anything to, to keep to it. To actually to keep it, and up to to the, you see from 1963 to 1992. The development budget that they were given for the north was 180 million. The entire development budget for a third of Kenya was 180 million. So you look at it and you say, did you re- did you really want this population or not? Mm-hmm. So that registration that Moi, Moi talked about came back came in 1988. They actually, you know, uh, they did something called Somali verification exercise, in which you were to state your father, your grandfather, your tribe, your sub tribe, your clan. I don't know what. And if they found that at any point it cannot be explained, they deported you. And so they deported 25% of the population. If if you couldn't this, um, but then um, being nomads and people who pastoralists, people who move around a lot, I I wouldn't think there is a documentation process for for that. So if you if you cannot find the documents to show that your parents or grandparents were born in Kenya and they have Kenyan documents but you were born in Kenya there is no other country that you know as home um doesn't that then lead to us calling them the marginalized <laughs> community i think i think uh, the constitution if you read the constitution it talks about the marginalized communities and it even set up a fund for that for the marginalized communities you know so this constitution actually was aware was aware to that fact that parts of Kenya were marginalized for you know the period that that uh, before this constitution uh, so uh, the issue is did we implement the constitution for that i don't think so because the policy towards in the north might have been repealed or the laws that were preventing you know the government from uh, government officials from actually uh, providing services may have been repealed mm-hmm. you know, but the attitude has not been repealed people have not been told that you know what those guys are just ours it's just that those, the governments in the past were dictatorial and had issues that 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 were you know discriminatory to them so the same thing is continuing in a in a way which is which is uh, you know not legal but more of uh, cultural it's an attitude. unspoken yes. culture that continues yes. and, and and you see the problem is those things that used to happen in the north are now happening here see the issue of shoot to kill you know these people people disappearing all these things were happening in the north between 1963 and 1992 people used to disappear people used to be killed you know there is a um, uh, eviction of, of of squatters by force those are the things that used to happen in the north you understand uh, uh, where the poor people have been uh, you know disinherited people have been you know forced off their land forced off their their own property those things used to happen in the north so the people who cut their teeth in the north in the 1960s 70s and 80s became rose through the rank and became leaders in Kenya so what, what they do is now what they learned in the north what they are is what they implementing, what they're implementing now, now. So, see, so we need uh, if we were to, to look at the constitution the constitution wanted to remedy those things but the constitution will not implement itself yeah yeah, yeah it has yeah. to be implemented by somebody yeah. and i haven't seen anybody who's interested in it yeah um and i remember a, f- a famous phrase infamous i think now pwani si kenya lamu tamu lakini pwani si kenya that that also happened <laughs> uh, but you see we don't reflect much on see we are we are like uh, this animal that forgets what happened yesterday uh, it's called the wathok eh? the wathok you know it's bitten here and then it runs and then it moves about 10 meters it is a very short memory span it is a short memory span so I think what we what, what we have become that kind of animal eh? mm-hmm. which uh, doesn't reflect on its past doesn't reflect on what happened in the north doesn't reflect on what happened in Kwani doesn't reflect on what happened in K- people actually fought for this constitution they fought for multipartism they fought for openness of society 
So are we to let it, you know, just, uh, you know, rot, disappear? We are going to touch on that a little while when you talk about culture. So we are in an election year right now. Um, my generation is, is being castigated out there for voter apathy. We are not registering. We are not exercising our right to vote. We are lazy. We are this. We are that. We are ignorant and, and all these things. But I, it's very systemic that we are where we are at. And our experience with the past two, three election cycles has also not given us any reason to have trust in our political processes at all. Uh, but this constitution talks about um, national values and principles of governance. Um, we commonly say that we have a constitution, but we lack the constitutionalism. Some of the things that it talks about are human dignity, equity, social justice, inclusiveness, equality, human rights, non-discrimination and protection of the marginalized, good governance, integrity, transparency, and accountability. When you look around, are you seeing any of these qualities in the people who are vying for political seats in this coming election? I, I, I think there are good people who are vying. Mm -hmm. But what happens after you actually win? The question is not when you are vying. <laughs> uh, the question starts from the process of actually you know, getting elected to you know, join the politics and then uh, actually delivering on that, on that. Something happens along the way. Uh, because majority of us are just transactional. We are looking at things from our, our own our own benefit. How much does it benefit us? Uh, so when you go to parliament as an MP, you are looking at uh, doing well in the five years and getting re-elected. Uh, this is a country in which 70% of the MPs are never re-elected. Oh, so you understand? That's, that's a high statistic. Yes, yes. yes. I, I was there are some constituencies in this country where nobody has ever been re-elected. You, you, you are sure you are going to go. And then in the five years you have, you don't even deliver on, on it. You look at the, the, the MCS. The MCS, I think the first time they were elected, in some, in some counties only probably a few were elected. So you, you, knowing this, shouldn't people be more of delivery oriented so that they can please their, their voters and get re-elected? So you see, so if you look at the national values, the national values is the way we're supposed to behave. It's the way the citizen is supposed to behave, the way the leader is supposed to behave, the way the, we, we are supposed to, you know, patriotism, patriotism, the love for the country. Love for the country is not just love. Love for the country should not be, should not be confused with the love for the politicians. No, I love this country. You know, this is Kenya. I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I've been traveling around this country. I see people who are, you know, they mean well. You know, most Kenyans mean well. Most people who are not in this political uh, um, environment or who are not directly participating in politics, they, they, are, they are just people who are, who are trying, you know, to do well and uh, uh, live their neighbors, you know, in a in a peaceful and uh, you know happy uh, existence. But uh, what happens to the politicians? Do we do, should we love them? No. Should we be patriotic to the politicians? No. Should we be patriotic, be patriotic to, to the to the to the political to the political parties, the tribal political parties we have? No. no. So we should be patriotic to the country. And what is good for our country? You know, it's what is in the national values. It's written here. Yeah. yeah. Good governance. It's written here. You understand? Yeah. Good governance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of issues happening with the judiciary. The, ju the, the, the judges are giving orders. What happens to those orders? They are, they are ignored. ignored. <laughs> At any point in a country where orders are ignored, worse things are coming. So you should not, you, you know, people might think that the judge made a, made, a, made a mistake in giving those orders. But then the judge was informed by the law. And, and let's say he was not even informed by the law. He, he, he made bad law. He, he made bad judgment. He, he gave a very bad order. That still doesn't mean that that order should, should not be implemented. Be it should be implemented, but appealed. It's an appeal process. Yeah. So you hear of certain politicians or certain government figures are ignoring uh, uh, court orders. That is against the national values. That's against the law. Uh, if it's for a guy from your tribe and who is uh, big up there, you think he's very, he's very brave in ignoring the... No. So <laughs> the basically, law. we don't have... Um, a legal problem. We just have a bad behavior problem. <laughs> uh, uh, this country has a very good constitution. This probably is one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. Mm. 
and it is a very detailed constitution. Most constitutions are not this detailed. They just give an overview, a framework of, of how the law should be should be should be enacted and how you know how uh, guidelines of how to, to behave and uh, what the what the country is and what it should be. You know that uh, that is in some countries there is no written constitution. You know uh, the the parent country, the one that created this country, <laughs> is called the <laughs> the British government. <laughs> Or the United oh my Kingdom. God, you called it the parent country. <laughs> yes, yes, the parent country, <laughs> <laughs> the mothership. Oh. Is you know, do, 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 it doesn't have a written constitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can imagine uh, Britain doesn't have a, a written constitution. They didn't have it for for a while. Yes, they have other laws. They have the common law. They have, you know, they have so many other you know the statutes and all that. But a written constitution is not there. But everybody knows it's a constitution. There's some sort of values that govern us. So we have a detailed one, one that tells us what to do in every situation. In fact, this one looks like some sort of a parliamentary you know, act. I yeah, would it's say. It's too detailed. Because I remember when the president said, people are stealing money from the government. Corruption is rife. I have tried everything I can. Now what do you want me to do? He literally asked us. Some nataka nifanye. And I remember looking at my constitution that day and I was thinking, isn't it clearly outlined here what you should do? You know, and at times I usually think that our elected leaders actually don't read the constitution. They have no idea what is in this constitution. Uh, uh, our... our um, um, our uh, police service, I, I don't think they understand what's in this constitution. I don't even think they know what is in this constitution. And that is, should be alarming to everybody because they need this as a guideline in their training. I have no idea what goes on at Kiganjo, but I don't think the constitution is part of what goes on there. I think there's, there's a general uh, ignorance of the constitution in the populace, the population, and Obviously, everything else is a mirror of the population. The politicians are a mirror of the population. The civil service are a mirror of the population. The police are a mirror of the population. So if, if, if I am ignorant and I'm, I'm appointed to a position tomorrow, that will not make me knowledgeable of the constitution. Yeah. So, and, and you know, that, 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 that is, you know, that, that's a terrible thing. But that's, that's the reality, that we elect people who have no idea on the law in which they were elected. You understand? And then what has happened is, I think the the byproduct of having this beautiful constitution is that we have created bloated type of government, bloated type of, uh, of uh, you know, parliament representation. There are too many levels of representation and there are too many people representing others. Uh, it's a good thing. We should, we should have, you know, that level of representation because we don't want to be, to a few people to become very important. We want the power to be shared across. Yeah, to be decentralized. But again, we need the the assumption of the constitution is that you are electing your best. You are coming up with people who have values, people who who, who embody the national values as, as enshrined in, 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 in this constitution. And then you, you, you look at it. One of the activists was elected to parliament, you know, and then uh, he talked for, for about six months. And, after that, he just kept quiet. And then, you know, activists, you know, we are always poking at people. So we went, to, people went there and said, <laughs> and asked him, you know what? You are an activist when you are out to, outside here. So what happened when you went to parliament? When you went to parliament. Yes. He said, you know, in parliament, if you if you go to parliament, there is the Satan sitting outside and it greets everybody. So if you, if you are greeted by Satan, <laughs> you get it. Sorry, you, you, you automatically change. You automatically change. So, so he said, you see, if you, you know, when you go there, other interests become more important. Let's start with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, one, of, one of the legalized, illegal things that our MPs do. The national government CDF. The CDF was taken to court. It was, uh, you know, rendered as what? As illegal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The court gave orders that this thing is illegal. They... <coughs> They went behind there, made some act, and then they called it national government, CDF. CDF. It, is a, it is actually, it is a threat to the separation, separation of powers, separation of powers in, in, in the constitution. It's a threat. But you know they, the are, they are now going into an area which is for executive, either executive at the county level, executive at the national level. So they are, they, are, they are now trying to implement, MPs are trying to implement government programs, which is not their job. The job of the MP is to make, yeah, to make law. Let me, let, me, let me just say one more thing about the ignorance of, 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 uh, of the Constitution. She's not only us. The Americans were accusing their, their congressmen of being, 
being ignorant of the constitution and uh, he, one of the activists like my, my filmmaker Michael Moore he took a, you know a van with a loudspeaker and then he was reading the constitution in front of congress so that people can actually <laughs> land <laughs> I, 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 I haven't seen any, that. any, any I activists challenged. doing that yes. so <laughs> I, feel challenged. I think those are the things that we need to do to tell people you know what have you read the constitution Yeah. Is the constitution taught anywhere in, in class? I've, no. I've been teaching uh, in, at university level. I'm not sure whether those people actually know the constitution. We don't we don't interact with the constitution in our basic education years at all. Um what Swahili wanasema mwachamila ni mtumwa. And part of uh, us not being able to even recognize our culture is because our true history hasn't been told to us. I'm just learning of the shift of all here and I'm like wow which which Kenya have I been living in and um this this constitution in in article 11 talks about culture but are we doing enough to really um preserve our culture I know of the Camel Derby in the north I know of um the Lamu cultural festivals I know we have um a few national heritage sites that are protected also by UNESCO but then as a people are we too westernized that um we've forgotten our grounding in our culture yeah let, let, let me refresh the, the the saying the Swahili saying that you just said which is uh, mtumwa then uh, somebody said mtumwa mtume Yeah, whoever lives in this culture is a real is, is a prophet is and a you prophet. look at uh, the religion prophets are the ones who actually used to uh, tell people their culture is bad yeah uh, there are two levels of culture we have one mm-hmm. that we should discard and one that one that we should promote uh, the culture of being african being uh, you know generous being brave being uh, uh, good to your neighbors being uh, hard working being uh, a community uh, which is you know in all african cultures the socialism you, part yes, of it yes we should keep that one mm-hmm. the culture of being corrupt being competitive <laughs> being you see all the cultures that we have got <laughs> since independence oh my god we that, have a culture of yes, being yes, corrupt the culture of being corrupt <laughs> being about you know it's about yourself everything is about me everything is about my family you know the culture of being nepotistic the culture of, of of rigging elections the culture of uh, of beating up people on the streets if you are a, a, a policeman the culture of shooting at people the culture this all these cultures that we have adopted since independence should be discarded we should become uh, human beings who respect human life uh, we should not you see people say, people you know people get a bit emotional whenever this, a thief is being caught somebody who has stolen something has been caught the ones of the petty thief that that grab your your purse or your phone and uh, they kill them they lynch them uh, but then when when uh, somebody big has i think there was a court case yesterday in which somebody was accused of stealing 24 billion or something 12 billion or something like that yeah yes. yeah and then a judge gave him you know 12 years or if i the the money mm. uh, if we if you caught this that one we will not we will not stone them or we will not uh, lynch them what we will do is we will we will actually make them to buy for elections <laughs> you, you understand what, what that, that, you know that you, you're, you're, you're looking at that from our culture is culture of thieving eh? yeah. but we don't like the ones that steal from us on the street we, so we, we need want to, to change so still on a large we need to scale. change that culture <laughs> and apply the law across the board Mm-hmm. If you steal a pass and if you steal the the government treasury it should be the same the same punishment yeah it's, it's, it should be the same you should be taken to court the process in fact the people who steal on the streets are poor and hungry we shouldn't have that kind of petty theft petty theft <laughs> because means somebody doesn't have anything to eat that's why they're stealing no politician wants to share power with somebody else specifically when the power has to be shared downwards uh-huh. yeah, so they want devolution to die devolution is, is one of the one of the things in, you know covered in the chapter 2 you have for seven counties yes they want that you will hear them say 30% you see before you give me the 30% i am entitled to 15 have you given me the 15 properly <laughs> in, in good time you know that yeah. so i think uh, that's why we should we should defend the constitution we should uh, we should know, know what is in the constitution we should you know quote the constitution in our in whatever forums that we have we should uh, whenever there is this uh, uh, debate about constitutionalism uh, young people should be able to to say their piece because that 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 this what protects you protects you against against dictatorship and tyranny from reigning in this country thank you very much 
So Kenyans, as we go into an election, chapter two of the Constitution of Kenya, article uh, 10, um, sub-article C, talks of good governance and um, integrity, transparency, and accountability. If there's anybody mwenye anataka kurayako and they do not show us that they have good governance or they have integrity or transparency or accountability, please, Avoid those people. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Um, we are grateful to Coffee Africa and Article 19 for supporting this podcast, and we will see you on the next episode.